Okay, I think we can slowly start. Welcome everyone. Um, it's uh, great to be um, hosting Roman today, Professor Roman Oros from Spain. Um, Roman did his PhD uh, in Barcelona some time ago with actually um, Professor Latore, our, our new uh, director here in Singapore. And then he did um, um, postdocs in Australia and in Germany, correct me if I, if I get it wrong, Roman, before becoming a professor in, a junior professor in Germany. And now he's back at the, his motherland, Spain, where he's a professor at uh, Donostia uh, International uh, Physics Center. He's uh, known for many different things, um, um, quantum many body physics, uh, numerics of many body system, and as well as his works on quantum algorithms for finance that he'll be talking today. And we're looking very much forward to hear him, Roman. Okay, so thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation. Let me let me share the screen. Uh, let me see. So it should be this one. Oh, hold on, one second. Yeah. Okay. Now it should be now it should be working. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So so I was saying thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, it's nice that um, I can be virtually in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I would love to to visit you guys there, but uh, you, you know should, the situation is not so. It's not so easy. It's been a long time since I since I was flying with Singapore Airlines actually, and um, yeah, at least we can meet on Zoom, uh, which is not so bad. So thanks a lot again. Um, yeah, in this talk, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna explain you about uh, applications of quantum computing for finance, which is a topic in which uh, I've been uh, involved in the last two or three years, essentially, where we started discussing in a, at a work group whether, you know, whether what would be the applications of early quantum processors in finance, all right? Um, now, the reason for this is because, you know, um, we quantum processors are getting more and more powerful every day. And, um, and one of the main verticals is going to be um, uh, financial problems. So. So anything that, you know, in financial institutions, central banks, uh, even finance departments of big companies, they, they, they have people solving very complex problems, uh, so very complex mathematical problems. And it turns out that most of these problems, if not all, they can, you know, uh, are such that a quantum computer can help. And even if you have few qubits and they are noisy, there may be also opportunities to, all right. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, just a bit of publicity of where I am now. Um, I'm at Donosti International Physics Center at the APC um, in San Sebastian. Uh, this is in Spain, even though oh, at some point the city was also French, uh, as far as I understood from the history of, of the place, because we are only 20 kilometers from France. So, um, so you know, we are up here in Spain. It's uh, the rainiest city in Spain, okay? But it's not a bad place to live, you know, we have uh, nice beaches, the ocean is very nice, uh, food is very good, uh, and it turns out that apart from that and a lot of tourism, we do a lot of uh, quantum science here. So there is not just the, the IPC, which is a research center, there are other research centers and universities here in the region, and there are also quantum startups, such as Multiverse Computing, this is a startup in which I'm involved in precisely on applying quantum computing to, to finance, okay? so. Feel free to, once you can travel, you are free to come and, and visit us, okay? Would love to, yeah. Yeah, not a lot of place. Actually, we have a very active visitor uh, program, but nowadays it's, you know, it's a bit uh, halted, but we'll see how it evolves. All right, so let's get into business. Um, we know about quantum computers. Um, we all work in quantum computers, uh, and they are being developed uh, very quickly nowadays, experimentally. There are many... Um, many important experimental advance, advances, no? Uh, and therefore, people nowadays are starting to think about what are gonna be really the use cases of quantum computing. So, of course, material science, discovery of known materials, finance, I will talk about finance in this talk, but there are also other, other verticals, such as the business people like to talk, no? So uh, there is also chemistry, pharma, discovery of new drugs, that's also an important application. Optimization problems. These problems show up 
all the time in logistics, in industry, in you know supply chain and so on. Machine learning applications, everything that has to do with uh, you know typical machine learning algorithms become there is a quantum version of all this, as you know, quantum machine learning. And I typically like to say um, that the most important application of a quantum computer, we still don't know it. Uh, and this is the most exciting thing about, about everything. So quantum computers are going to be useful for essentially anything that we can imagine and, and much more. So, the, you know, the most important application of, what, of quantum computers, uh, in my opinion, is still to be discovered because I have the feeling that we will not understand what is going to be the important application until we have the quantum computer. It's like asking Alan Turing in the 30s whether Twitter will be the most important application of a classical computer. And he probably will say, what the hell is Twitter? No? So, uh, so here we, we are in a similar situation. It's a quantum, think, quantum pigeon. Who knows? No? <laughs> but at least we know that these, these, these applications are going to be important. Okay, so in this talk, I want to talk about finance. Um, and who is interested in finance? Well, it turns out that, that many people, uh, first thing you think about is banks, you know, these guys that have money, you know, um, but also central banks, uh, also finance departments from very big companies, um, which are almost like banks, okay? Rating agencies, uh, regulators, uh, tax offices for fraud detection, and so on and so forth. So essentially anybody that, um, deals with, uh, with financial problems mathematically is going to be interested in quantum computing because it turns out that quantum computers can offer speed ups and also more efficiency and more accuracy to, to the calculations that they are doing. Um, this is a good question. Why, as physicists, why should we care on quantum computing for finance? And every time I make, do this question, there is always somebody that says that, well, you know, because I want to make a lot of money, no? <laughs> but uh, but that's, not, that's not the right motivation, okay? The right motivation is that finance is actually a very interesting field by, field by itself, finance and economy. It's full of very hard mathematical problems. And of course, it matters to us because it has to do with, with how money flows and, you know, how we exchange uh, assets in, in our society. Okay, and so that this is full of very hard mathematical problems, and those are the kind of problems that we know how to solve with a quantum computer. So what is finance? So if you look at Wikipedia, it tells you that finance deals with the uncertainty in the future behavior of an asset. An asset could be my car, could be an apple, could be oranges, okay? And the prices and returns, that means profits or losses, that it may have in the future. Okay, whether the prices will go up and down, depending on, you know, who wants to buy, who wants to sell, and all that. When you put all this into context, you know how it is, no? Uh, you have all seen these pictures from Wall Street. Uh, it's a complex system, looking at it as a physicist, no? It's a strongly correlated, of course. This is full of variables which are strongly correlated, and it's very difficult to predict. So if you're a physicist, this sounds like very familiar. Um, <coughs> it's a strongly mathematical, no surprise, uh, field. And, and the people who, who work at banks um, doing this, these algorithms, they have to know, essentially they are mathematicians and physicists, no? So they deal with optimization problems, they do a lot of Monte Carlo simulations, they solve stochastic differential equations, nowadays they are also doing machine learning and artificial intelligence, and so on. So, you know, it's kind of a very uh, canonical application of, of mathematical tools. Um, people who do this at financial institutions, they are called quants, not for quantum, but uh, for quantitative finance, okay? So if you hear about quants in finance, it means people who do algorithms, okay, um, in a bank, for instance. These are the quants. All right, so um, what type of problems do we find in finance? And what type of uh, approaches are traditional quants uh, using? So, okay, typical question. Um, how do we optimize a portfolio of assets, okay? Um, this is the question, how can I, which assets should I include in a portfolio, how should I change this composition according to the market, and so on. Well, it turns out that this is the typical optimization problem, and this is handled with optimization models and optimization algorithms. Second question, how can I detect opportunities in the market uh, and take profit by trading them, the thing that traders do, okay? How can I detect or predict whether the market is going to go up or down, and so on. Well, typical approach here is machine learning. Now, last but not least, um, how do I estimate the risk of a portfolio 
or the risk of a company or the risk of a, I don't know, of a research center, you know, uh, going to hell or, or having a, you know, having a financial crash, how do I estimate the risk of this? Well, turns out that this type of estimations, nowadays the people do them with Monte Carlo, all right? They do Monte Carlo sampling of, you know, some very complicated probability distributions. In these three big families of, of problems, uh, this is not exhaustive, all right? But um, most of the problems that people do in quantitative finance nowadays fall into these three classes. Um, you know, in all these three, uh, quantum computing can help. Of course, in optimization, we can do quantum optimization, we can use quantum annealers, we can use uh, other quantum optimization algorithms and so on. In machine learning, of course, we can do quantum machine learning algorithms. If there are classifiers for, you know, um, predicting, uh, you know, whether the market is gonna go up or down, that's uh, an example. We can also put quantum classifiers there and so on. And for Monte Carlo, also quantum computers can help because with quantum amplitude estimation, turns out that we can get a quadratic speed up with respect to Monte Carlo sampling. And, and this is huge. So people in finance are very interested in this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about examples of these three, three classes of, well, these three big families of, of problems in finance and some examples of where you know, quantum computing can help. All right, so let's start with quantum optimization. There are different strategies, as you know, in quantum computing to solve optimization problems. Maybe the most famous is uh, quantum annealing, uh, which is based on adiabatic quantum computing. But nowadays, also with universal uh, quantum computers, it means on the, on the, with the circuit model of quantum computation, such as, you know, processors such as IBM Q or Google, it's possible also to program other algorithms, such as this quantum approximate optimization algorithm, the QAWA. And also, of course, variational quantum eigen solvers. So let me let me revise this very quickly. Uh, in quantum annealing, um, the idea is to perform an implementation of adiabatic quantum computing, uh, but sort of an imperfect implementation. So, so as a reminder, adiabatic quantum computation is all about finding the ground state of a problem Hamiltonian that they call HP. Now, originally, what I want to do is to minimize a cost function. Say I want to, or, or to maximize, okay? So say I want to maximize the returns of, or the profits of my portfolio, all right? Um, now, once you have the objective function that you want to, to you know, to maximize, uh, you map it to finding the ground state of a problem Hamiltonian. Essentially, you express your function in terms of, of bits, and then you map it to spins, and then you have a problem Hamiltonian, such that the ground state is gonna be the solution to your problem. Now, finding the ground state of this Hamiltonian is very complicated. So the trick of adiabatic quantum computing is to say, no, let's start instead from a different Hamiltonian that they call H0. And I know how to prepare this ground state. It could be, say, all spins polarized in the X direction. Uh, and then I'm going to interpolate very slowly between the two Hamiltonians. And if I start in the ground state of H0, when I evolve in time, the adiabatic theorem tells me that if I evolve very slowly, and there is no crossing between the, the energy levels, okay, of this Hamiltonian, then eventually, at the end of the evolution, I will end up with very high probability in the ground state of the problem Hamiltonian, which is the solution that I want, okay? Now, in practice, this is what people use many times, uh, also in quantum annealing, uh, one has a linear interpolation, then the running time has to scale like uh, of the order of magnitude of one over the minimum gap square, all right? And typical Hamiltonians that people have here are, well, as I said, H0 is typically a, a magnetic field in the X direction. And the problem Hamiltonian, it looks like an Ising model with arbitrary couplings and arbitrary magnetic fields. Now in quantum annealing, we have this sort of setup, but we have it at some finite temperature. Of course, the temperature cannot be exactly zero. And also we don't know exactly what is this gap. So we don't know how slow we have to go. So what we do is we just, you know, do different interpolations with different annealing schedules, what they call. And we do a lot of sampling and obtain many proposals for ground states of, of, of the Hamiltonian, of the problem Hamiltonian. So we sample the outcomes and at the, and at the end of the day, one chooses um, the best solution that is found. This is exactly what D -wave, the D-Wave machine is doing. And, you know, it's giving very reasonable solutions for, for many problems. So that's a way of solving optimization problems with quantum computing. Um, 
Another one is the Qualwa algorithm, which is essentially adiabatic quantum computation, but discretized in, in discrete steps. This was proposed also by Farrell, Goldstone, and Goodman, so the same guys that invented adiabatic quantum computation. Essentially, we pick up the unitary time evolution and break it with, into, into discrete gates, gates like this. But we leave these parameters here, this time, uh, you know, the total time that is running its, uh, its, uh, its, um, its Hamiltonian, we leave it as a free parameter, okay? And then the idea of Quagua is, okay, let's apply this quantum circuit here, all right? where I just leave the alphas and the betas as free parameters. And I'm gonna use this to just do sampling of the ground state of the expectation value of the energy of the outcome, okay? And once I have this, I use this to optimize, say using gradient descent, the parameters of my circuit and, you know, keep iterating. So if you're familiar with the variational quantum eigen solver, this is exactly the same idea, but the gates are given by the interactions that they have in the problem, all right? So this is the Quagua algorithm. It has good and bad things. Uh, the good thing is that, well, since the gates are given by the interactions, um, you know, this quantum circuit is gonna be a pretty good variational answer for, for the ground, you know, to find ground states because it's gonna have the correct entanglement structure or at least the one that you expect or close to the one that you expect for, you know, for this type of evolution because it has the interactions, okay? Now, the bad thing is that this, these interactions may be very complicated to do in practice. So if you are a, a guy at IBM and you know that uh, you can put a two-body gate very efficiently between these two qubits, but not between you know, two qubits that are separated by some very long distance physically in the chip. So uh, maybe that has a lot of error and you don't want to do that, no? Uh, whereas here you don't have that freedom. So the good thing is that you have the correct entanglement structure. The bad thing is that, well, the gates that you are given, they may be very complicated to, to implement. But still, um, this is also an option to solve optimization problems. Last but not least, variational quantum eigen solvers is the similar idea to, to Quagua, but this time we choose the circuit. So we put a circuit here that has some variational parameters. Say, for instance, well, in this example, there, are, there is a set of one body, ro uh, one qubit rotations followed by an, some entangling gate, which is fixed, and then some one qubit rotations, and so on. We iterate this a number of times. Uh, and you know, here the parameters are the angles of these one qubit rotations, all right? And then, you know, I just run the circuit, I choose some initial value of these angles, run the circuit, sample the energy from the outcome, and then use the sampling to op choose the direction in which I have to modify my parameters to go towards the ground state, and then just iterate. Well, the good thing here is that since I am the guy that is uh, deciding the circuit, then I can just choose my favorite circuit. Um, and I can put a circuit that I know how to implement very well in the, whichever platform that I'm using, no? So that's a good thing. Now, the bad thing is that maybe the circuit is not a good answer for, for your ground state, okay? Or, or for finding your ground state. So perhaps the circuit doesn't have the correct entanglement structure that you will have in the evolution, and therefore well, you need to be a bit careful. But as a, as a variational answer, it's always bad, okay? Uh, BQE is a very popular algorithm nowadays, so people have used it a lot, um, for instance, for quantum chemistry calculations, and, and it works reasonably, reasonably well. All right, and it's also implemented, also QAOA, no? Quagua, they are both these, these algorithms, they are implemented in the typical libraries for, uh, for quantum computing. All right, so these are the tools that we could use to solve optimization problems with quantum computers, and now what do we do in finance? Well, here are four examples of optimization problems for finance. The first one is the canonical problem for optimization is portfolio optimization. We can also do it dynamic, actually. So the problem is easy to understand, is find the optimal composition of a portfolio, okay, say along a period of time, and you have to find the optimal composition every day, let's say, in such a way that at the end of this period, I'm going to maximize the returns of the portfolio maximize the returns of the portfolio, and if possible also, minimize the risk, okay? So you know the volatility of the portfolio, which is the variance of, of how things are changing. Also, the, also this needs to be minimized, all right? So you want uh, high returns and low risk, all right? Well, it turns out that this problem can be put mathematically as the optimization of, of a cost function, all right? Uh, I'm not going too much into the details, but I can tell you if, if you want. 
there are some forecasted returns that you can compute from the prices of, of the assets. Uh, this is a vector of holdings at every time step. Then there is a factor here that has to do with, with the risk. Okay, it has, it's measuring the, the covariance tensor of the assets. This is also possible to measure from, from the returns and the prices. Uh, and then there is sometimes there are other terms here. The two important terms are these two. Okay, so in canonical portfolio optimization, this uh, or in what people call uh, Markovitz portfolio optimization, these are the two terms that they are always there, uh, risk and profits. And now people here start adding constraints to make the problem more realistic. So for instance, um, transaction cost, okay? So when I change, when I sell or buy something, you know, the bank, uh, uh, you have to pay a fee to, bank, to the bank, all right? So this is modeled uh, by a term here, okay? There is a transaction cost matrix. Also, um, the impact that you have on the market, if you are, you know, a millionaire or a billionaire and you, and you suddenly buy half of the stock of apples, then of course that's gonna change the prices of apples, okay? Because you are doing a very big movement, no? Um, well, turns so out that you can also model this uh, with a term like this, okay? Market impact and so on. You can keep adding here terms depending on the constraints that you have and you can make this formula actually very complicated. But in the, at the end of the day, you have to maximize the return, all right? Now, other constraints here, typical are, well, the, max, the total amount of, of, of uh, investment is constant. Uh, the maximum amount of investment is also, you know, you have a cutoff on how much you can invest per asset and so on. These you can also impose, all right? And well, turns out that this is a typical problem that you can solve with a quantum computer. You, you just map this cost function to a problem Hamiltonian and then, you know, throw it into a quantum annealer, for instance, or or some, some variational quantum eigen solver or a QA or a audio. This was um, proposed by, by several people. You can, you can read these papers down here. Um, but there are a number of works already on portfolio optimization uh, with quantum computers. The last one, it's actually a collaboration that we did um, with our startup here in San Sebastian in collaboration with uh, the people from BBBA. You know, BBBA is a bank in Spain. It's one of the top uh, 40 in the world, I think. And here in Spain is one of the big ones. Um, and we did uh, portfolio optimization with, uh, for the first time with real data. So we took uh, real data of 52 assets over eight years, all right? And then we managed to do optimization of, you know, to find optimal trajectories uh, with this data that the bank provided, which is actually public because this is, you know, it's prices of in, in the past. Um, and yeah, we did this with, a body, with, with several technologies. You can have a look at the paper if you want. So, so we did uh, with D-Wave. We use D-Wave Hybrid, which is a hybrid quantum classical approach that they have at D-Wave that works very well. We use also IBM Quantum with variational quantum eigen solvers. And also for the first time, we use uh, tensor network methods, which are not quantum. They are classical. Uh, but this is what people nowadays call quantum inspired, which are methods you know, that are based on, on how quantum computer works. Uh, but uh, but at the end of the day, you can run them on a classical computer. Well, it turns out that with tensor networks, you can also um, do optimization algorithms that, uh, believe it or not, they are beating uh, what people are doing nowadays, okay? Best results we found here were with D-Wave and with um, with tensor networks, okay? This I, this I have to, to say. D-Wave hybrid, uh, Roman, or...? D-Wave hybrid, yes. Okay. D-Wave hybrid. Yeah, the hybrid was working very well. Yeah, um, yeah, and this was the first implementation with real data. Even in IBM Q, we were able to fit the real data. We had to do some pre-processing, but uh, we were able to, to put it inside. All right, let's move on. Another optimization problem in finance, finding arbitrage opportunities. So, um, so what is this about? Um, uh, this is about finding cycles in the market that give you profit at the end. So imagine that I have, uh, I don't know, I have euros, I mean euros, no? So I have euros, and then I, I change the euros for, uh, for dollars, American dollars, US dollars, no? And then I change these US dollars for uh, Singapore dollars, okay? And then I change back to euros. So in this cycle, I've lost money, okay? Because I had to pay fees. Well, it turns out that there are some cycles in the market with complicated objects that instead of losing money, you can get a profit. Um, this is very strange, but these, these opportunities are out there. And uh, identifying these cycles is an empty heart problem. Um, 
Now it turns out that with a quantum optimization algorithm, you can also identify these, these cycles. Um, essentially, you have to, to write a cost function that is similar to this. It has different pieces. Well, there is one that is a cost, and you have to impose that you have a flow constraint here. And there is another term that you impose that you go once every asset through an asset at most because you know, it has to be a cycle. This was proposed in, by the guys from One Qubit, which is this startup in Waterloo in 2016. And uh, they wrote a very nice white paper about this and they implemented a proof of concept uh, that this idea is working on, on the D-Wave 2X, which is the processor that they had by then. I don't know how many qubits it had, but, uh, but not so many, not so many for D-Wave. No. Um, and they did it, I mean, it was a toy model. It was for a small network of only five assets, but the idea is that they proved that this was correct and they were able to identify the, the cycles that uh, gave profit. Another one, and this is a typical problem in machine learning, but you can also solve it with uh, quantum computers, which is credit scoring. Um, you go to the bank, you want to apply for a loan, and they do a background check, and they decide whether they give you the money or not, okay? Well, you can also do this with, a, um, with an optimization algorithm. There is a cost function like, like this, so you have to decide which are the relevant features uh, for deciding whether the applicant will get the money or not, okay? That's the, that's the point. Um, and then essentially, well, this is the way to do it. You have a matrix U that organizes um, the features of the past credit applicants and also some numerical values. And then you have a vector of recorded decisions. You find the correlations between the columns of this matrix and, and you know, you have it here. And you also have the correlations between the columns of the matrix and, and the final decision where there is a correlation between the features and the actual decision and you have it here, and then you want to find which are the relevant features with the constraint that they have to be as independent as possible. So this was also another white paper by the one qubit guys in 2017. And uh, instead of implementing it on D-Wave, they, they ran it on a simulator with an SDK that they had. And they, as a proof of concept, they also proved that, that with an optimization uh, algorithm, you can also solve this problem. But this is a typical problem in machine learning. Now, a problem that I like a lot is prediction of financial crashes. And here, the, the question is very simple. You are given a very complex financial network in equilibrium. It means you know, everybody's happy. And now there is a tiny change in the price of, of something. Okay, So the price of, uh, of apples goes up by epsilon. Another question is, could there be a massive failure of everybody because of this change? This will happen. No? Uh, it's very unlikely, but, but who knows, no? Maybe they trigger some strange collective effect. Um, well, it turns out that this problem is NP hard. It can be put into mathematics. Um, um, <coughs> and there is a toy model for, for modelizing it, actually. So we have a network of institutions. These institutions have some assets. These are the market values of the institutions. Uh, this is how much is in each institution owns itself. This matrix here tells you how much the institutions own each other. There are some assets, say apples, oranges, and so on. They have these prices, P, then how much each institution has of these assets is this matrix D. And then there is another term um, that has to do with panic. Um, this has to put into the model uh, as well. It essentially, it's telling you, it's trying to model the fact that if everybody starts, uh, say, selling apples, the prices of the apples will go down. And then the people will see prices going down and will think, well, if prices are going down, then I'm going to sell <laughs> because why, why do I have apples if they are worthless, no? And then, you know, there is kind of a retroactive effect here and suddenly there is a discontinuity and, and the apples crash, okay? Uh, and it's the same thing going up. This is the typical bubbles, okay? That people are just buying because it's going up, but it's going up because people are buying, you know? So, this can, this can be modeled by uh, some kind of a step function. And at the end of the day, this strange situation can be put into equations, all right? And it's a question like this one. It's some sort of inequality. When this is equal to zero, people say that there, are, there is financial equilibrium. If it is larger than zero, then they say that the financial network is out of equilibrium. Now, if you have a look at this, um, finding the market values given the rest of the, of the parameters, well, this is a variational problem. Okay, finding the equilibrium is the same as finding the ground state, let's say, of, of this cost function if you're able to put it as a Hamiltonian. So that's the idea here. Map this cost function to a spin Hamiltonian. 
And then it turns out that you know finding the equilibrium condition is equivalent to finding the ground state of, of a spin system, all right, with two-body interactions. Um, now, what is a financial crash? A financial crash, when you see it in this physical picture, is nothing but a first-order quantum phase transition between a ferromagnetic and a paramagnetic phase. And this I can show you in the slide next to this one. This is just some technical details about how to how to do the procedure. So it's not maybe so important. You just express everything in terms of qubits, uh, and at the end of the day, you map the qubits to spins, and you end up with a spin Hamiltonian. All right. Now this is the example of the phase transition that I was uh, mentioning. Um, this is the number of failures of institutions as a function of some perturbation that we introduced in, in, a toy model, in this toy model for a financial network that is very small, this one here, and it's randomly generated. So here the nodes are the institutions, the cross-holdings are, uh, you know, uh, represented by the links. Um, now, it turns out that if the perturbation is small, there are zero failures. It means you are in a ferromagnetic phase, let's say. If the perturbation is sufficiently large, suddenly there is a discontinuity, so a first order transition. And in the language of spins, this is going to, uh, to you know, to your face, to ferromagnetism. Whereas here in the financial uh, language, what you see is that suddenly, you know, uh, there is a massive failure of all the institutions. Okay. So this is a very nice analogy. This is why you don't see financial crises coming because they are first order transitions. You don't see any correlation length diverging. Um, you don't see it coming. And suddenly there is a tiny change and you go from being here in this neighborhood to being up here. And then everything is, is you know, everything fails. <coughs> we implemented this on D-Wave um, with the friends from, uh, from Bilbao. Um, and actually, well, uh, as a proof of principle, also as a proof of concept, very small system with three assets, even though I think that nowadays we could go, sorry, three assets, three institutions, even though I think that nowadays we could go much farther than, than this uh, to much bigger systems. But we saw that as expected, so the D-Wave machine was reproducing the correct values. Um, introducing this step function that I was mentioning, uh, this was you know the exact solution and D-Wave was exactly reproducing the correct equilibrium condition, okay? We didn't check the financial crash because only with three assets it was very small. But I think that now we have some ideas on how to how to improve this and, and actually see the, the crash. All right. So this is what I wanted to say about quantum optimization. Now let me say a couple of words about um, quantum machine learning applications in finance. Um, that's going to be what what is going to come next. Um, if, by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hands, or I don't know if you prefer to wait until, well, if you raise your hand, or raise your hand to the moderator, let's say, <laughs> or uh, I don't know if you prefer answer. to wait until the end, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions anytime you want, okay? Don't be shy. Um, yeah, I, let's continue. I can ask a question at this point, um, uh, Roman, to give you time to breathe as well. Um, so, so going back to your... Um, um, uh, or mapping, you know, a general problem with this optimization thing is you have to have as many qubits as variables in your problem, at least, at least, um, yeah. at least right? And that's kind of um, quite uh, challenging for uh, yeah. for uh, NISC devices for, uh, you know, where we are at the moment. So um, I don't know if you uh, have any any ideas yeah. how to get around that. For example, we, we figured out recently, we can discuss it a bit more later, a systematic way to build up from a kind of a, a non-correlated type of states to more correlated states as we do in, in chemistry. And we, we found some signs that this is possible to yeah. do um, larger values. But I expect when you said you did this, um, the can you give us a different numbers on the D-Wave applications, like how many variables, how many qubits, yeah, so it depends a bit on, on the problem. So for instance, for this financial crash, the variables are continuous variables, and then you have to discretize and so on, and then there are multi-qubit interactions that you have to boil down to two qubit again, and then there is a lot of overhead. So it's true that you need many qubits here. But for instance, for a um, for portfolio optimization, we ended up doing, yeah, here it is. Opa, what is it? Here, 1,272 fully connected qubits. And, I mean, uh, these are, are D-Wave qubits, okay, so slightly. These are D-Wave qubits, D-Wave yeah. hybrid. Yes. Okay. 
we were firing. Not, not really planned on not it. So, exactly so not, if you not wanted not to do done. this, um, uh, Tensor Networks could simulate this, I guess. Yeah, yeah, we did it also with Tensor Networks, yeah. Okay. I think there's We saw that D-Wave, D-Wave hybrid was really fast, um, but we know also how to improve Tensor Networks by now. Okay. There's a general correction by Esperanza, I don't know if you want to take it now or at the end. What are your views on quantum computing for fraud pre prevention in finance? Fraud prevention. Uh, this is going to come in the next, in, the, in what I will explain now about, fraud, okay. about uh, quantum machine learning. So if All you right. want to go with five minutes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Could I ask a fast question, Dimitris? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, uh, hi, Roman. Uh, my question is about benchmarking about purely classical algorithms because they are mm -hmm. very good for optimization. So do you have any, any hint that the scaling is better? Of the, yeah, it, of it, it, depends on, it, it depends on the algorithm. So in, in this work, in this one, for instance, we also tested classical algorithms, but we use the, the standard optimization libraries uh, that people use in Python. I think they are called Gecko. And, uh, and with Gecko, we were not able to solve the problem for 1,200 qubits. So it, it was, you know, it blew up. So, uh, but of course, that doesn't mean that, that there are no other, I don't know, with simulated annealing, let's say, or, or some other technique that you could go further, or perhaps using GPUs. This, this we didn't test. Yeah. They can do up to 10,000 variables these days, depending what you can, you, you can That's use. True. We, mm. can, we can discuss a bit more at the end, I guess, in a smaller group, not to keep everybody. Uh, yeah. um, so let, please go ahead. Yeah, our feeling also was that it could, it could be possible to go. I mean, these 1,200 variables with D-Wave, it was two minutes optimi optimization. Eh? And, uh, and with Tensor Networks, it took a bit more, but now we understand also how to, how to improve this by easily a couple of orders of magnitude. So uh, yeah, I mean, this was just a first step. I think that we need to keep studying this. <laughs> and okay, so let's... Sorry, just specific towards the direction of real qubits as well. Like, what can we do with variational ones in this? Because, you know, there's D-Wave, um, definitely some very nice benchmarkings there, but there's yeah. a lot of issues and, 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 and how to say, and confusing perspectives from the community, what's going on in, in, that, in that box as well. So yeah. as, as the NISC processors now are getting into a regime that we can actually try those things mm -hmm. with, uh, normal quantum processors, noisy yeah. ones, then that gets, gets much more exciting. Yeah, no, no, for sure. I think that NISC processors, the ones with, uh, you know, universal model and so on, they are very valuable for quantum machine learning, actually. Uh, of course, also for optimization, but then they are more limited. But for quantum machine learning, you can have important uh, applications already with few qubits, as, you know, as Jose Ignacio knows, for instance, very well. So, uh, so yeah, and this has impact also in finance. So let's let's move on. This is a brief summary of quantum machine learning applications. Um, since uh, you know, I will not go into the details, but the, there is this uh, nice review from 2017 about quantum machine learning algorithms. It's a bit outdated, three years already. But the idea is that well, you need a universal quantum computers. Uh, it's very challenging, and it's still you know people are still developing nowadays new algorithms for quantum machine learning. No? Lots of topics under investigation, but there are nice speedups here um, that you could get. Examples in finance, uh, well, classification. There are quantum classifiers, um, you know, deciding whether your picture is a cat or a dog, let's say. In finance, well, there, there are zillions of these problems. Uh, credit scoring is an example, uh, whether you are a high risk or a low risk customer, deciding whether the market will go up or down, you know, these type of things, they, you, they, you can also throw that into a classifier. Now, there are different options and alternatives for quantum classifiers. Here, I'm just um, mentioning two, but these are already a bit outdated from 2013. Uh, last year, there were a bunch of very interesting papers on how to do uh, quantum classifiers with D-Wave, actually a quantum support vector machine. Also, Jose Ignacio had this uh, data re-uploading paper on uh, <coughs> that, you know, it, it proves you that you can build uh, quantum classifiers with very few qubits, and they give extremely good um, they're extremely powerful and they give you extremely good uh, results. So this is this paper that I mentioned here. So I, in my opinion, quantum classifiers is one of the directions in which these uh, NISC quantum processors are gonna be applied uh, uh, in industry, let's say. Into it's gonna be one of the first things with, uh, with relevant applications in the industry. 
in my opinion, okay? Because as we were discussing for optimization problems, they look a lot more limited, but I think that for quantum machine learning, um, you know, they, they look like more tailored for quantum machine learning applications. Yeah. In optimization, we have to figure a way to do this efficient qubit encoding, and we can discuss a bit at the end. We, yeah. we, we have some ideas how to reduce the number and do some sort of like mean field theory and, you know, build up the correlations, the classical correlation model systematically mm. to attack those problems as we do in chemistry, kind of. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, we can discuss afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Um, more quantum machine learning applications, uh, regression, uh, fitting a line to a set of points. Uh, it turns out that for doing this, uh, well, before that, of course, there are lots of applications in finance. They keep doing projections in the future, and at the end of the day, they keep doing regressions all the time. How many umbrellas I'm going to sell next week in my shop? Okay, that's a typical regression problem. Or will NASDAQ go up or down? No, that's also a, you can also use regression algorithms for this. <coughs> well, how do we do this? You know, one needs to find the optimal fit of parameters by minimizing some least squares error. You compute the quadratic error, you want to minimize, you want to find the parameters that minimize this error for your, you know, for your fit. Turns out that for doing this, you have to invert a, ma a matrix, the data matrix, and this is computationally costly. So if you have a lot of data, this is, you know, uh, so it's a bottleneck of the algorithm. But you know, in quantum machine learning, there is this HHL algorithm that tells you that you can solve linear systems of equations a priori exponentially fast and uh, you can use that to compute the inverse of a matrix. There are some conditions on when this algorithm can be applied and so on, but well, at least there is the potential of having also improvements uh, here. Also principal component analysis, which for physicists is uh, something very similar to the singular value decomposition. Um, in, in finance, it has to do with this, with this problem essentially. So you're given a data vector with the stock prices between different times, then you compute this object here, which is called the covariance matrix. This encodes the correlations between the prices at different times. And then the problem is to find the dominant eigenvalues and eigenvectors of, of this matrix. By dominant, I mean the ones that have the largest eigenvalue in, in absolute value. This is important because these eigenvectors are the ones that tell you what are the most probable trends um, in this time evolution, okay? Uh, turns out that it's so important that in finance, this, the three dominant eigenvectors, they have a name by its own. It's, they are called shift, twist, and butterfly, okay? Um, and well, as we know, in classical computers, so in computing the singular value decomposition or finding these eigenvalues is costly. It escapes like order n squared. Whereas for a quantum computer, there are quantum PCA algorithms that are very nice. What they do is they map this uh, covariance matrix to a reduced density operator, or they, they just say that this is something like a density matrix. And then they use tricks of quantum tomography to estimate the eigenvectors of this, uh, of this matrix, okay? Um, this was a nice paper from 2014, and, uh, and yeah, so it gives you an exponential speed up a priori. Okay, so these were some applications in finance uh, of quantum machine learning. There are lots of them, okay? Uh, as I was saying, in my opinion, I think that quantum classifiers are, uh, <coughs> are very promising, okay? Now, connecting to uh, the previous question, there was this question on how quantum computers can be used to, to prevent fraud detection. Yeah, um, well, with quantum classifiers. That's the answer. So, um, so for instance, we did a we did a we did a proof of concept, but this was not published, and maybe the question was in this direction, with a database of a credit card fraud. Okay. Um, so, <coughs> so there is this open data set where you have something like three hundred thousand or five hundred thousand inputs of transactions of credit cards, and there is like um, I don't know uh, one hundred of them. They are fraudulent or something like this. So the data is highly imbalanced. This is real data, and it's an open data set. You can find it, no problem. Um, now the data is very imbalanced, and then the problem of the tech being able to identify which guys are doing or which transactions are the ones that are fraudulent, this is very hard because if you want to try, say, a neural network, you have many examples of, of good transactions, but very few examples of bad ones. So, so how do you 
how do you train this? No, this is very imbalanced. And then you know, people in machine learning they they have lots of tricks with dealing with this. Um, and you can throw this into a standard classification algorithm. A mach use, I don't know, a neural network or a support vector machine or something like this. But you can also throw it into a quantum support vector machine. Okay. And we did it. And what we saw is that under the same circumstances, the quantum support vector machine has 2% more accuracy at least than the, than the classical one. So this is a, a big improvement because a 2% in fraud detection can be a lot of money. <laughs> Okay, when you translate it into into dollars, okay, and we also saw that you know there are other algorithms that one can implement that are actually may actually be faster than, than you know the standard machine learning algorithms that people are using nowadays. So, so in this way, with quantum classifiers, um, one can apply quantum computing to to fraud detection. Okay, uh, in this case, it was a supervised learning algorithm, but uh, but there are options to do also unsupervised learning. Um, a quick question. Is when you don't have an example or you have no clue whether they are good or bad. Yeah. Robert, on, the, on, your, on the specific one you mentioned now, um, did you use a simulator? Uh, because, you know, this, this is very hard to implement this quantum support vector machines in, in hardware and so on. No, it was, it was on real hardware. Yeah. So how, how very, few, very few qubits. I think it was ah. like, uh, like 10 or so, not so many. Okay. Not, not, but not this, uh, this massive data set you mentioned earlier, a subset of this. Or it was a sub well, there was a pre processing of the data. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, in okay. order so to be did, able to, to feed So you came, it was probably did some PCA or something before, before yeah. and then you got some. Uh, okay, all right. Yeah. Okay, more questions? Uh, not okay, so let's. Um, oh, yes, no? Go ahead. Okay, yeah. so let's move to the, to the last topic, which is quantum amplitude estimation. The algorithm is, um, is actually from 2002. It's almost 20 years old. Uh, and it was a very nice algorithm that I learned when I was doing my PhD, because it's the typical thing that you learn when you do a PhD in quantum computing. And it turns out that almost 20 years later, people find applications. No? It's about, well, we have this operator, A, and implements this unitary operation. And you want to estimate this parameter here, OK, little a, with, you know, with a very high probability. I will not go into the details, but this algorithm is very nice because it's a mixture of uh, Grover and Shor's factoring algorithm. Essentially, you have to um, build this, this object here, which is very similar to the Grover operator. And then you put it as the unitary operator of a quantum phase estimation algorithm, which is the, you know, is the, the core of, of Shor's factoring algorithm, okay? Um, so you do quantum phase estimation with this, Grover, sort of Grover kernel, and at the end of the day, you do a Fourier transform and a, a measurement. And the claim is, and this is actually what they prove mathematically here, that from this measurement, you read a string of bits from which you can estimate this parameter, A, with very large probability. All right. Um, why is this interesting? Well, because they understood that the number of operations that they, you have to put here is uh, quadratically less than and just by doing a classical sampling, all right? So you have a quadratic speed up. Now, as such, this is interesting, but then in 2015, Ashley Montanaro came and understood that you can use this to, to estimate uh, all the typical moments of a probability distribution, expectation value, uh, the variance, uh, and so on and so forth. You can use this algorithm for estimating it. A bit similar as doing sampling with Monte Carlo, but turns out that quadratically faster. So the number of times that you have to call the probability distribution is actually quadratically less, all right? This is a bit mathematical, but it's, it's how it works. You have an operator that is able to build the probability distribution. This is just the classical function that generates the probability, okay? And then you have this function and you want to estimate this object here. This is like amplitude estimation. And well, uh, so Ashley Montanaro has proved that you can use quantum amplitude estimation to, you know, to compute these averages here. And now, depending on how you choose this function, you can compute very, you know, lots of things. You can compute expectation value of a variable. You can compute uh, the square of the expectation value. Sorry, the expectation value of the variable square, and then you can get the variance and so on. Okay. Message here is that everything that you can compute with Monte Carlo sampling with quantum amplitude estimation, you can compute the same thing, but quadratically faster. All right, so with a square root speed up in the number of samples that you, you have to generate. 
applications in finance were lots. So there are many, many people doing quantitative finance and computing Monte Carlo. Um, <coughs> canonical example is uh, pricing. Um, so pricing is a problem in finance that is uh, also very canonical. Uh, they are, it's called pricing of financial derivatives. This is not a mathematical derivative. A derivative in finance is, is something else. It's a complicated financial object that has a price, okay? And the price depends on, you know, on, on some underlying assets, let's say apples, oranges, and, and bananas. And depending on how they evolve, the price of the derivative is going to be something, okay? That's a, a financial derivative. It could be a contract, for instance. I don't know, some complicated object. Now, the, it's a big problem in finance is how to put a price on these objects, okay? And there is a whole theory for this. It's called the black scholes merton model. And at the end of the day, it amounts to solving the stochastic differential equations. But this may be very difficult to solve. And therefore, what people do nowadays is just do Monte Carlo. They have a probability distribution, distribution, distribution of, of prices of an asset, and then they do sampling over these probability distributions, okay? And, and these are probability distributions of the evolution of prices over time. So these are complicated, complicated distributions. Now, well, if they do Monte Carlo, one can do quantum amplitude estimation here. And um, this is an example of, uh, of, an, of, you know, of an application from 2018, where they did European and Asian options is a type of derivative with quantum amplitude estimation. And, um, this is as a summary of the results, okay? Here, the number of samples to estimate this price, uh, the classical ones, is this line here, the orange ones. This is how Monte the error in Monte Carlo goes down with the number of, of steps, with the number of samples. And now with quantum amplitude estimation, you have this red dotted light here, line here, which is the, um, you know, uh, the fit to these points. But you can see that this is going down much faster. And if you compute the, ra compute the ratio, between these two lines, you see that this is close to two, which means that it's a quadratic speed up, okay, on average. So yeah, it works, okay? This was implemented on, on real hardware, and uh, but also for a very small system, but as a proof of principle, you know, it tells you that it works. Another application is computing risk. Turns out that there are risk measures that you can compute from probability distributions. <coughs> there is such as, for instance, there is something called value at risk, that measures the risk of a portfolio, all right? It's this complicated function, the probability that, you know, a given variable is less than a cutoff, uh, being larger than, you know, a given parameter. Um, again, you can compute or estimate this using quantum Monte Carlo, but um, the guys at IBM uh, in Zurich, they proved that you can also solve this with uh, a quantum computer. Uh, in particular, they use this IBM QX2 with only five qubits. Two asset portfolio, so it's this is a toy model, but it was already sufficient to see that the scaling of the error with the number of samples again was going quadratically faster than than the classical ones. Okay, they actually got one point better, so <laughs> I think that with a bigger machine they were able to they would be able to to go further here. Okay, so that's what I wanted to explain to you. Uh, so let's uh, jump to the conclusions. In this talk, I've uh, hopefully convinced you that uh, finance is one of the fields where quantum computing is going to have applications very soon. Uh, there are at least, at least three main trends, optimization, quantum machine learning, and also um, quantum amplitude estimation. Of course, there are probably more, but these are three big families of problems that people are worried about. Um, as I've Try to convince you, in my opinion, I think that quantum computers are going to have an important role in how finance is being done at banks. And this is the reason why they are starting to get interested into this technology. And, and it's inter important to say that you don't need a very big quantum computer with, you know, lot, with lots of uh, error corrected qubits to, to find already applications. Already with, with a small NISC devices, um, it's possible already to start solving some problems, especially the ones that have to do with quantum machine learning and quantum optimization, in my opinion, and also in the opinion of other people. Uh, we believe that these are going to be the ones that, that are going to have, you know, there's going to be an, an impact of quantum computing in the, in the short term, okay? And um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Again, feel free to come and visit us in San Sebastian. We do lots of interesting stuff, not just quantum for finance. We do tensor networks. We go out 
for lunch, we go surfing, uh, we go to the beach. So once you are able to fly again, <laughs> feel free to come. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Roman. I reached your club from, uh, from uh, Zoom. It was very nice uh, and um, uh, broad and uh, interesting talk. What is Chacoli? One thing I see. Chacoli, Chacoli is a wine. It's a, wine. It's a, uh, it's a wine from, from the Basque country. Ah, uh, nice, nice. You should try it. Yeah. Yes, for sure. <laughs> so, any more questions from the audience? Uh, you can actually yeah. just unmute yourselves, uh, introduce yourselves, name and place, and ask. Um, I have a comment myself. Ah, well, Jose Ignacio, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Roman, my my comment is that I'm, I'm a little bit uh, worried that in many of these applications, it is not mentioned that there is a classical preprocessing mm. that actually may take as much time as a computation in some cases. So that actually improving of a piece of the computation in, in real terms does not produce any advantage when, when you really go to the real problem. No, you understand yeah. what I mean? And uh, for instance, uploading of data, uh, this has been mentioned by by Dimitris, no? I mean, yeah. if you finally have to update a large amount of data, and that is 99.9% uh, .9 of the time of your computation, why do we care about improving uh, the other small part of the computation? And the same for problems where the preprocessing may involve diagonalization of large matrices or things like that. And, and then, the errors of, uh, in particular, of readout, uh, that they may really uh, um, make it very difficult to use in practice these things because in finances, uh, in particular, you need uh, some accuracy for your predictions. So yeah. can you comment on, on the, these two things? Yeah. I fully agree. <laughs> so so pre-processing of data is, is very important. So for instance, for, for some quantum machine learning applications, when you need this quantum RAM, let's say, uh, what I've seen is that nowadays there are different proposals for, for building this, uh, but it's true that that's a bottleneck, okay? Um, we'll see how it goes. Concerning pre-processing of, of big amounts of data with, uh, say, PCAs and so on, it's, uh, it's also true. But uh, it's also true that for for um, for for classical algorithms, even without preprocessing, you cannot. So you, sometimes you have to do the preprocessing um, uh, for sure, because otherwise it doesn't even fit on the classical algorithm. So, um, but it's true that's also a bottleneck. The hope is that at some point we will be able to do this preprocessing also with a quantum quantum NISC device. Okay, hopefully. Uh, and about the errors, uh, yeah, it's also correct, but this depends on the hardware. So, um, so in my opinion, well, I think that <coughs> I'm also on the application. So if you're interested in classifying, the errors can be very critical, okay? So if there is a fraudulent guy that escapes, then that means a lot of money, maybe. In portfolio optimization, however, I think that it's more robust against errors. So maybe it's not so critical to find a portfolio that gives you back a 40% profit but if you find a one that gives you a 35%, people are also happy. So uh, in, that, in that problem, it's the error is not so critical, but in fraud detection and, and so on, it's true that, yeah, we need high quality qubits. Yeah, and, uh, and that's a technological challenge. Yeah. If I may add on this, um, I think from the two um, kind of bottlenecks I was mentioned, I'm mostly personally afraid of the first one, the quantum RAM. Uh, for, for all of us that have talked experimentally or worked with them, it's, it's extremely challenging really to do an, even a simple type of um, version of that, of, of, a, of quantum RAM. So I, I would say we really need to think outside for, for like when we design quantum algorithms and think of a new ideas that, you know, do not require that. I mean, in your table, you mentioned um, uh, some of them do not require, some require, and some others, you know, uh, could do. Um, unless we have some sort of fundamental uh, breakthrough experimentally, um, I think that that would be a, a big bottleneck. On the classical preprocessing, yes, again, depends on the problem. Uh, um, 
uh, especially if you have a lot of data, it's very, it can be very time, time consuming. And, and these classical guys are very good, just to, to say they have been optimizing their, their algorithms. And you know, when we go out, of course, and, and talk to industry, you have to really deal with the best of, of, of their side. When we write physics papers or upstream work, then it's enough to do a proof of principle. And that's very interesting. And that's how science progresses. But to really get the interest of the people, we have to think every stage of this process, how to optimize even the classical part, the quantum part, and, and the processing uh, part. Um, any other questions, comments? Uh, I have a question. Uh, hi, Roman. Hi, Dario. Um, so, in, uh, when you were talking about optimization, you said that tensor networks was actually working better than um, some of the um, tools that they have in the market now. So, I would like to understand from you, um, why do you think that it works so well? What is the, what is the advantage of and, uh, you know, well, how long they would be so, yeah it's, it's like it's like it's like uh it's like a problem in physics why tensor networks work better than uh, say um i don't know exact organization or some other technique you know? so in this case it's because uh, because we can handle we have a very efficient answers for um for for computing the ground state of of a hamiltonian okay and uh and you know we tested it on on, on on the algorithm, and we were able to to go farther than you know standard optimization libraries with tensor networks for finance. I mean, okay, um, you know we are in this particular problem for portfolio optimization, but in general, I think it's true for all these uh, problems that show up in quantum annealing. You have Hamiltonians with essentially almost random connections. I mean, they are not really random, but uh, <clears throat> but you know arbitrary connections between all possible qubits so you have something like a fully connected network and a priori you will say that this doesn't look like the typical hamiltonian that you are able to solve with tensor networks because you know you don't have a spatial dimension it doesn't have a clear structure but in practice you can throw it into the solver and, uh, and see how it goes and it goes very well it goes very well you know tensor networks depending on the tensor network that you program it can be extremely efficient okay and therefore uh, well um, the algorithm can can run very efficiently as well okay or uh, and there is also room for trying complicated tensor networks more adapted to the problem and so on this we are already investigating and trying and we see that they actually work better yeah than just uh, you know um, plain optimization so. but I, I mean my intuition is that they work well precisely because of the same reason why they work well in physics because here you have a set of variables that um are highly correlated and finding the ground state at some point you have to go through some point where correlations are huge and this is exactly the place where tensor networks are good okay thanks uh hello i have a question can you ask uh i there was one by jing long uh kisha first let's let's hear the jing long one jing long tan and then we take yours as well Go ahead, uh, I, I have a question uh, regarding the quantum SVM and the, uh, the normal SVM comparison. Like, um, uh, so I have two questions regarding that. One is like, what was the number of features of the data that you used to um, train the quantum SVM? Because um, uh, uh, it, like, we are restrained by the number of qubits of the quantum computer and was it trained on a D-Wave or was it trained on a gate-based quantum computer? The second question is um, how do you um, compare a classical SVM and a quantum SVM because um, fundamentally they are different architectures so we make certain yeah, yeah, it's, it's assumptions true. on the output. So, so we, it's possible to run quantum SVM on D-Wave uh, for, for quite a few features actually. Um, this we didn't do. Um, we did quantum SVM on IBM Q um, with a quantum algorithm. It was a bit restricted because the number of qubits was not so large. Um, and considering the features, we had to do a PCA first. Okay. And then in the end, I don't know how many features. Honestly, I don't remember <laughs> how many. I, I know there were, there, were, there were like 30 features. And at the end, we shrink it to say the most uh, relevant ones, but those were some. Well, I, 
I don't want to say a number because I don't remember exactly. This is the order of ten you know. it was uh, IBM. Yeah. Yeah. But there, there was some reduction. Um, but it was something of the order of the number of the number of features was something of the order of the number of qubits or something like that. I remember, but uh, I don't remember what the number. So, but it was yeah. So there was a preprocessing to reduce the number of features. Yeah. <clears throat> You remember, and then, like, we, and then we also, they, and this I didn't mention, but we also implemented tensor network classifiers uh, because there are also quantum, mas, well, quantum inspired machine learning algorithms based on tensor networks. And here you don't need to do any PCA. You can, everything fits and, uh, under the comparison. So coming back to the second question, how do you compare the quantum SVM with the classical one? <coughs> well, we compare the accuracy under the same type of data how was the accuracy of the predictions? And we saw that the quantum one was quite more accurate, which is indicating that once we scale the number of qubits, it's going to improve. Okay. Um, and the quantum inspired one was faster, actually. My question is let's say you can have a classical SVM with a higher model complexity and greater um, expressive power. How do you? Um, uh, use a common metric to measure the quantum model and the classical model, like in terms of expressivity power, in terms of um, rep uh, representation power or uh, model complexity, number of parameters. Uh, we com what we compared was the, the number of false positives. Uh, so the number of, cor of, uh, of you know, predictions that were wrong. Okay. Misclassified ones. So. The, mis the, the data that was misclassified. Okay. In particular, the ones that, you know, the, the, the fraudulent ones that, that escape, those are the important ones. Actually, there are, there are several measures here that one can use. Uh, mm. So the people that do imbalanced data, they, they have different, different measures. Uh, and that's, that's, what we, that's what we checked, the final result. Sorry, can I? Uh, so I mean, one quick thing, uh, and we need to take Kishore's question. Let me, let me say that um, we usually have an um, uh, off a second kind of discussion afterwards. Maybe we can take it here, but if uh, people want to leave now, uh, um, uh, if it's too technical, feel free. We'll, uh, if you, Roma, can stay for another five, ten minutes, it would be great. But um, uh, let me just check if there are more general questions from the general audience so we don't have to keep everybody is is anybody wants to ask a more non-technical question if not you're welcome to stay but uh, maybe we can discuss by by means some more technical issues so back to Jing Long on this one, one question on Jing Long's thing one comment is I mean quantum SVM is is it's not for this, you can do faster and you have the exponential speed up if you can do quantum RAM, et cetera, et cetera. But on the accuracy, it's not obvious why it would work better. Why? Yeah, that's the that's point. Here it was not, we were not comparing a speed up. So it was not about the speed up. We know that with few qubits, you well, okay, maybe it can be faster. You might, see, you might, might see some scaling, but, but you see is that it, the, the, the solution was different. So, so, so the what, classification what, was, it was better do, at classifying. What do you think that came from? It was a... Entanglement. That's my only intuition. And also the people, the guys at IBM Q uh, in Zurich, they, they saw something similar also with, with a different problem. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Kishore, you want to throw your question? Yeah. So I mean, like uh, one of the questions was obviously like which uh, earlier person like before me who was asking like uh, Jing Long was asking like it was about the model capacity. And I also believe I believe that if you increase the model capacity then uh, the accuracy of the classical part could be improved. But anyway, like I have another question which I would like to uh, ask, like the, this question maybe we can discuss in the private session and so on. Uh, this question is about the dynamic portfolio optimization part. Like, uh, can you go to the slide? Like, of the... Yeah. Dynamic portfolio optimization. This one? Okay. So, I mean, your constraints here, they are linear, right? I mean, uh, yeah. And, uh, and no, no, they are not linear. Um, these guys here are quadratic. No, 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 no. I, I'm not talking about the objective. I'm talking about the constraints. Ah, these ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, constraints are like, you know, they, you, have, you have like a fine, like, uh, yeah, like linear constraints, right? And, uh, and this WT vector, it's like this WT is a vector with capital N elements, right? I mean, that's what I can uh, ask. Which vector? Which vector? Is yeah, what? Like, what are you optimizing over? Like, what is your uh, reason? I mean, like, 
like what is it, how does the feasible i mean the solution from the feasible region like looks like uh, like uh, i mean the, the optimizer the how does the optimizer looks like what the, what are the variables yeah yeah so what are the variables yeah so the variables are these double these omegas here so so this is this is the percentage so let's see so this omega is how much do i have of asset n at time t okay, okay. And, uh, and that's, this, that's what I want to optimize. And, Those and, are my variables. Yeah, yeah. So this W and T, they should go in the op, like the in the object objective function. So in your in your objective function, are like where are they hidden? Are they hidden in W T? Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. So this I didn't say it's true. So these guys are vectors. Okay. 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 So, so, you're, vector. so at every T, this is a vector. Okay. Yeah. So it's the n cross one column matrix or something. Okay, yeah. so the first term is linear, second term is quadratic, then third term like this delta WT, what is that? I mean, the what, sorry, can you repeat? I, delta I, I, WT in the transaction cost, like what yes. is this from delta WT? Oh, here, this, this lambdas and, and so on, this delta. So, so this is exactly, this is the increment, this is the change between, so this is WT plus one minus WT, okay? So this is, this is the change in the vector for a period of time. All right. Okay, increment. So, so this is increment. Okay. okay so, so this, so this is, is on the, in the continuum formulation. This is the derivative. So this okay. also looks quadratic to me, right? I mean, uh, this is quadratic. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. Quadratic. And, and uh, so basically, you have been given lambda t, lambda t prime, sigma yes. t, and mu t, and yes. then you have to given the constraint, you have to find the optimum return. So, exactly. So it's basically it looks like a quadratic uh, program, right? Uh, it's a quadratic uh, function, and you will say, yeah, but it, but but solving it is empty hard because no, it's, no, it's, no, it's, no, it's no, quadratic no, optimization. No, yeah. I mean, like like linear can also be empty hard. Like linear programming can be. Yeah. It it's a quadratic the, optimization. Yeah, it's a quadratic function. It's sure, sure, sure. So, so then basically you have quadratic program with uh, linear constraints, and uh, it seems uh, you can uh, you can make it into like unconstrained. Uh, like of absorbing uh, these uh, variable, like these constraints in the like by making yeah. the Lagrange multiplier, like uh, by absorbing them via Lagrange multiplier, and then uh, yeah. uh, solving. Yeah, that's the, that's exactly how we do it. <laughs> okay. awesome. so we put the we put the constraints as like with Lagrange multipliers in the cost function. I mean, sometimes the constraints are are natural. For instance, this one. There is a cutoff on how much, what is the maximum amount of this? Well, if you work in terms of qubits, this cutoff is already given to you, okay? So you don't need to impose it if you don't want to. But what we do is exactly, we pick up these constraints and add them into the cost function in terms of Lagrange multipliers. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. yeah that, that's what I would, I would think of. Uh, my last question is about this financial cross crash prediction thing. Yeah. Uh, you say that it's NPR, it's NPR in what? Like number of assets? In the number of institutions. What is so, so there is there is a financial network, okay? So it's not here is an institution and it has a market value. What is the value of you know Amazon, okay? And these institutions have cross holdings between each other, and then they also there is a number of assets, okay, that they that they you know that they have, and it's uh, the relevant variable here is the number of institutions. I see, I see. Okay. Yeah. So it's empty hard in this in this number. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Dimitri, uh, since we have Patrick here, who is one mm. of the authors of, of many of the papers that mm. were, have appeared, maybe listening to his opinion about the future of quantum computation for finance would be great. No? Sure. Yeah. Hi, Patrick. Uh, yeah, yeah, hello. Um, Hi. Um, yes, yeah, so of course, I have not a speech prepared, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, well, Jose yeah. Ignacio put you the... Jose Ignacio put you on the spot now, and I have agreed. No problem, no problem. So I would be great to hear your your opinion for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Um, so first, uh, thanks for all the citations. I mean, this is awesome. <laughs> um, so there's of course various papers that were mentioned, and for each paper, I think one has to clearly discuss like what are the assumptions and what are, you know, what are the what do we need? What is the classical algorithm, and is there really a speed up? So that's, that has been already quite, um, discussed a little bit in terms of, let's say, the quantum RAM. Um, 
So one, I think one basic use case is always the linear systems. We can always I mean, often go back to the linear systems algorithm by HHL and see. So if that's, that's sort of a very, you know, specific problem that one can always look at and then see. And you see all the problems that also quantum machine learning has. You see this already at the, on the HHL algorithm level. Um, so, so that was one comment I had. Um, so let's say the, the input, the data input model, and then the, the output of the data, the, the noise. Um, okay. Um, you mean, what else, you mean what else Patrick, that the... Uh, Any specific questions? You mean the, the idea yeah. that you don't have such exponential speed up in HHL when you really compare to the... So it depends. It depends. It depends, it depends on the input model. That if you, in HHL, you have been given an oracle that gives you the entries of the matrix. And also, it's a sparse matrix, and you've been given an, another oracle that tells you where are the non-zero elements of the matrix. Then HHL, in principle, can get this exponential speed up. So, but but if I if I maybe Dell is advocate here, what is uh, what is the chance to get those two oracles, and especially yes, so in practice, in practice, really, this oracle is either an, a function that can compute the elements of a matrix that is efficiently computable. Or as, as you, as a devil's advocate, indeed, um, it's a quantum RAM that, that stores the matrix. And that, that applies more to machine learning problems where this, the, the matrix comes from some data that comes from Google or from Facebook, right? So in that case, we will always need something like a quantum RAM or a similar device. Um, but in other cases where the matrix is computable, we don't need the quantum RAM. So this would be more in cases like maybe fluid dynamics, or uh, I see I see an A star person also here. I think Yijun is here. Yeah. So in, in some of these cases, um, I mean the the HHL can could lead to quantum speedups without needing a quantum RAM. Is it, does it, is, does it make sense? Yeah. Yes, and this is very important because uh, it's really really hard experimentally. It's I personally don't see any. Any way I mean, to, it is, it uh, is hard also, but one has to notice that uh, it hasn't been looked at as much as, let's say, scaling up qubits, mm. improving quantum supremacy. But so, in principle, one could argue that if people look at this in, with a lot of manpower and... Is the superposition, is a difficult, it's a different problem in the sense that you need to make these weights, so you get your like pointers and what is there in the store, then you, make, you need to make a nice, like the, the right superposition. And um, like in some know, sense, it's just state preparation. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's state preparation know, from classical data. On that kind of uh, maybe there is a different way that we don't know yet uh, that um, to encode the data in that sense that might not require that. That, that might be a case, but yeah, I have no idea. Um, so yeah, there's uh, thanks for again for all the citations. I mean, all, all the references. Um, I I think there's still a lot of work to be done and. To really, and by the way, I should also mention that the algorithms that we have been like in quantum machining, these are not NISC algorithms. Just to mention this, I mean, these are not NISC, these are not near term things. In some, some cases, there have been versions of them by other authors that are more NISC -y. I think even um, Jose Ignacio has a paper on, on some of the um, principal component analysis related. Yeah. Algorithm that is a, more, a bit more NISC. Um, well, yeah, my most more NISC and more quantum all the way because it, it it's applied from from for states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we also did a little bit of this um, option pricing with unary basis because yeah. finally we added all the amplitude estimation in the second version of the paper. And and you see that in the NISC era, uh, it turns out that and when you take into account errors and everything, yeah. it, it provides a better scaling. Then they cross at some point uh, mm -hmm. around uh, of the order of magnitude of, of uh, well, of whatever, 16 qubits or so, 20, then there is a crossover. Yeah. So for, for this, also yeah. for this slide, our experiment was not done on a real hardware. I just yeah. mentioned that um, we have done, we only did this small experiment on, on a classical computer. Um, this was just a proof of principle at the time for, for this European uh, call option, yeah. um, this, this plot here. Uh, 
you know, guys, uh, uh, and Roman, I, I think that there is a chance that uh, we should convince our experimenters to make a, a, a machine that substitutes Monte Carlo so that, mm -hmm. that we can train the generation of probability distributions that do computations of moments on the qubit and apply amplitude estimation as a special purpose device. You see? I do think that this makes sense at some point. It is based on quantum sampling, yeah. I guess, and quantum. Yeah, there are, there are also these these Gaussian boson sampling stories and so on. Maybe. Yeah. Photons, photons um, might be more optimal. Well, yeah. No, but then you cannot do the amplitude estimation to compute the moment of the thing. You you may <laughs> have uh, photons to do to generate the uh, probability distributions, but then. Processing thing into another photo and all the control nodes, all the operations. Well, that's a cha that's a challenge in general. Yeah. I think quantum phase, quantum amplitude estimation is a very hard. No, but if you have a, a if you have a universal quantum computer, you can do it. Well, so if we have I'm a universal saying, quantum computer, then we do Patrick's algorithms then as well, I right? <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that you can separate the generation of probability distributions from the computation of the momentum. And in the first case, you only need few gates uh, nearest neighbors. And the second, you need one qubit, a number of qubits that concentrate all the, uh, all, all the precision, let me say. So I think that it makes sense at some point to device, uh, design the device in such a way that this is uh, more doable. Well, I, this takes us very far from the discussion we're having. But let me say that I believe yeah. there is a machine waiting for us, a quantum machine that substitutes Monte Carlo. I think I think your mm -hmm. intuition is uh, is, is I, I agree with your point, Jose Ignacio, in the sense that deep inside, the the strongest thing of quantum mechanics is this probabilistic nature, and Monte Carlo is really based on that on something. So there must be there must be something we could do better there compared to what we have at the moment. Um, and the less gates are required, the best it is. Um, so, yeah, we can try approaching them.